Hey everybody, Mo Buttle here. As you know, your host at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I'm with Lighty Klotz. He, Lighty, you wrote this book called Subtract, and I don't know what you did in your book launch, but somehow I ran across, you know, I'm always paying attention to authors as an author myself, and and I ran across the book and you had me with the title. I bought it like in 10 seconds on Amazon. It came the next day, whatever. And I just dove right in. And I that's saying a lot because next to my Eames lounge chair that looks at the TV in the fireplace, there's like a stack of eight books that my wife teases me constantly about. And yours like skipped over other books that were in the queue. And I just devoured it and loved it. Thanks for being on the show. I think the idea of subtraction is really going to resonate with our audience. Well, thanks for having me, Mo, and thanks for the kind words about the book. I'll have to give the feedback to the publisher because they definitely did the, the launch stuff. And it's funny, too, because most of the the readers I encounter, it's kind of through word of mouth. And yep. it was hard to get the word out during the launch because the launch was was April the first. Well, not it was a year into the pandemic that April where it's like nobody... Are we going to bookstores? Are we not going to bookstores? Yeah, Are, how, yeah. And I mean, they were struggling to, all the paper distribution was screwed up, right? So they're like, oh, well, we used to send paper galleys to all the influencers and you probably would have gotten a paper galley in that case. But then now they're just, how do we get books around to people? Yeah. And so it was just a really weird time for, for a launch, a really hard time for the people working I, on that. I can't imagine. I, my friend Josh Kaufman redid his, he did a 10th anniversary of personal MBA right in the middle of the pandemic. Okay, and just, yeah. we keep in touch a lot. And he was telling about how, I, I'll tell you, I'm happy that my last book was before the pandemic and the next one will be uh, September, 2024. So hopefully nothing will happen <laughs> between that. <laughs> so, all right, well, let's get into it. I'm super excited. I think that, I think the big idea Everybody knows that that this season of the show, season five, we're really focused like on a big idea and then how to apply it with some really fun questions at the end, like you've seen. And I think this idea of uh, the mindset of subtracting versus adding is really unique. So why don't you start us off with the big idea of of a mindset of subtraction versus addition? And if you want, I, I that Lego study really struck me. That might be a fun entry point, but up to you. Uh. I've got it with me, so I we can use it. I don't have my oh, son fun. who initiated it, but I've got the the replica. But so yeah, here this was what we were basically dealing with. It's like we had the Legos here, and we we're building a bridge. He was three at the time, and trying to make this bridge. And as you can see, you don't have to be a civil engineer to know that this bridge isn't level, right? So I went yep. to add a block to the small shorter column, and my son before I could do that. <laughs> had removed a block from the, the longer column and set about on his way. And, you know, I've read all these productivity books and, you know, I've been interested in elegant design. I knew about minimalism or taking things away, but this really kind of crystallized the thing that, you know, essentially the whole book's about, plus, you know, the research is about, which is like when we face something that we want to make better, in this case, very trivial Lego bridge, physical, we want to make this thing better. Why is it that our first thought is, hey, what can we add to this thing? Uh -huh. And often, as I would have done in that situation if my son wasn't there, we add and move on without even considering this whole category of options that is also a way to make things better. So I think that's the the core idea here. And it, you know, the long story short with the research, we spent a lot of time studying this in a lot of different situations and it seems to stretch across physical objects but also kind of social situations how we organize our lives and our calendars and itineraries and ideas so it's pretty prevalent in all these really important things that we do in our lives yeah yeah and so audience for those of you who are on audio podcast you couldn't see uh, what lighty was showing but a video of you saw it there, there's just a simple bridge like a long lego piece held up by two struts or supports and one side had three and one side had two and if somebody was there was lego sitting around and said hey make this even lady i think the idea is that almost everybody like a mat do you maybe even have some math and science around this almost everybody would add a brick as opposed to take away and then if we if we extrapolate that out into our lives we're always adding more initiatives, adding more meetings, adding more follow-ups, adding more everything. 
And maybe the answer a lot of times is actually to subtract something. Lydie, your, your thoughts on that? Yeah. And I think, you know, the from the most abstract example, the Legos to the most kind of concrete, there's a, our university did a strategic planning exercise, right? We got a new president. That's what everything happens at universities when you get a new president. They yep. got, they did a great job. They said, hey, you know, alumni, students, donors, faculty, give us ideas to make this University of Virginia better. And I think about, I forget the exact numbers, but there were 700, over 700 total ideas. Fewer than 10% of them actually suggested taking something away. And I'm not saying wow. the additions are bad. 70% of these ideas being additions isn't necessarily a bad thing, but if only 10% are subtractions, it suggests that you're kind of missing systematically ways to make the university better. So yeah, this is something we found in a lot of different a lot of different ways. And I, I'll give one more example just to kind of really yep. make the idea concrete. Travel itineraries in Washington, D.C. So we <laughs> we were studying this with Legos and with the strategic plans, with writing. We even had these abstract grids that people tended to add to. And we're like, let's make something that gets people to, that they're obviously going to subtract. So we gave them this ridiculous travel itinerary to Washington, D.C., 14 different things in a single day. And these are big things like visit the Smithsonian, right? Eat lunch <laughs> at a five-star beast. Yeah. Air and space has to be there, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, Lincoln Memorial. I mean, huge things. And there's we. I figured it out on Google Maps, but there's like two and a half hours of travel time, assuming ideal D.C. traffic between these huh. different activities. But anyway... People are presented this itinerary in a drag and drop interface and said, hey, how would you make your day better? You can move things, you can whatever you want to do. People added more stuff to that <laughs> itinerary. So it's, wow. you know, again, across all these different contexts, people are thinking, hey, what can I add? What can, and, and not thinking about what they can take away. And we did do follow up studies too, to, you know, kind of make sure that it wasn't just, oh, we actually want to add. We do very simple things like, hey, after somebody adds to the Lego blocks, did you did you consider subtracting? And they're like, oh, no, I didn't. But if I did, I would have chosen it, right? So that's a simple yeah. one. We also did things like giving people just really easy reminders before the study. Like, hey, remember, you can add or you can subtract. And that increased rates of subtracting. So which is yeah. very surprising. Like reminders increase rates of things. But also it didn't increase rates of adding, right? So for adding, it was redundant, what you're already thinking. For subtracting, yeah. it brought new ideas to mind. So I want to dig into this because audience, it's not that often that we actually get to talk to the core researcher. Like Lighty, this is the one of the things you've really focused on. And a lot of times we're talking to an author, maybe they cite research, maybe they don't, but it's not very often we have this just direct conversation with the person doing the research. So Lighty, I think that's super cool. I also think it's super cool that you've got this background in engineering, in business, in architecture, and basically design thinking and business all mashed together, which is super, I just think super interesting coming from a former actuary. Um, <laughs> I almost I, I almost went to school to be an architect, but my teacher, as I think I was a junior or a senior in high school, the only people who got A's were people on the wrestling team or women. And he was the wrestling coach. And every uh, single other- is was 100 the architecture teacher was a wrestling coach? Yeah, so it was literally a hundred percent of the people got A's were either women or which was like two people or yeah. wrestlers, and every single other person got person got a B and nobody got a C. I did this like informal survey. I'm like, I'm out. I don't, yeah. I don't like this. <laughs> anyway, I I like still to this day after the pain of that decision decades ago, I still like look up to architects. So anyway, you've got this background. So what? So why is it like? Why is it we don't like? by default, think of subtract like we think of add. I just think this is fascinating. Yeah. I mean, the cool thing is when you find one of these defaults, you know that there are now all of a sudden you can start look for looking for the reasons why. And if it's one of these things that's kind of wired into our brains, it's instinctive. There's probably a combination of biological and cultural and socioeconomic reasons. No. And I think, you know, so biological, your brain might go immediately to like, oh, well, yeah, one one reason that we would do this is because over time it's been evolution it's been an ad advantage to us passing down our genes to like stockpile food and other goods yeah when things aren't going well right but in that that makes sense and is certainly part of it i think the 
the more revealing one for me or the one that seemed kind of more relevant to my day-to-day life was this desire to display competence. And I knew that we had this desire to display Uh. competence, right? To show that we can effectively interact with the world around us. I mean, it's why we attend redundant meetings. It's why we, it feels good to put a few more words in the email or, you know, do some extraneous work, even though we know it's not the core of what we're, we're really trying to accomplish. I just didn't realize how it was rooted in our biology. I mean, so the, the classic example and one that I use in the book, I think is these bower birds. They're the birds where the male bower bird goes and builds a nest. And then the female bower birds go around and, and look at the nest and decide which male to mate with based on which nest they like the best, which all sounds pretty normal so far. But then the female goes and builds a nest to shelter the young, right? So the whole point of the male build nest is just to show that that male can effectively interact with the world. And that's a male-female example, wow. but this desire to display competence cuts across genders and, and species, right? Yep. And so I think that's something to to keep in mind right when we think about what when we don't subtract is it because we're thinking of it is it because we don't think we're going to display competence if we subtract and then you know we can start to figure out ways to get around that i think there's also some but that those are the biological reasons definitely cultural reasons right i mean when you first start an organization it makes sense to add things, right? <laughs> it's like you've got one employee, it's probably a good idea to add another yep. employee if you've got the option. It's only when you've got 50 people that it makes sense that you, okay, now well, let's start looking at reporting lines and the organizational structure. And there might be some things that we could take away to actually make this organization better. And it's the same with building civilization, right? You build roads between two cities. The first one, it makes sense. After It's only after yeah. you've got this huge build up society that these options for subtraction are there. So you could argue also maybe that like for a long time, subtracting has just been not as good a way to make changes adding. And therefore we've kind of evolved this shortcut in our thinking to just think of subtra- adding first. Yeah. And then the it, last wait, one. And one I, I, just to, just oh, to sorry, jump sorry, in, Lady. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, it's all good. You know, I just hadn't thought of it in, I think the synthesis of everything you just shared is like adding works most of the time or much yeah. of the time. It's yeah. great. So like, it's, it's so simple. It usually yeah. works. So we do it all the time, but let's just say it's 20% of the time subtraction is better. We just don't even think of it, even a fraction of that. So I don't know what the right answer is. You know, it would depend on the context, but we probably don't think about subtracting because adding usually works, but man, when subtracting the answer, it sure is more effective. Your thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. And I think also that when you're when everybody is systematically underusing an option, right? That's a that's an in a, there's an inefficiency in the the market of improvements, right? And we can yeah. exploit that if we recognize it. Yeah, this is amazing. Okay, so that that was such a killer opener. I want to dive into a bunch of specific applications. So, as I reread the book, which I did this weekend, because I just like wanted to dive into it again tons of by the way takeaways how many how many pages i have folded over is oh, a good sign nice. of like value yeah. of a book and you're in the couple dozen range lady so nice work on that <laughs> nice that's awesome that's an honor i mean uh, to put ideas in other people's brains is that's an amazing yeah. amazing thing to be able to do especially smart people's brains <laughs> so well much. you didn't get that on this episode but i can introduce <laughs> you to some people so the first one i you know our audience has obviously got one foot in some deep technical expertise, one in doing work, one work in winning some work. You know, they've got to learn the business yeah. development skills bolted onto the doing of the work. You've got a lot of expertise in your mind. So a lot of times there's growth strategies. There's like when somebody say makes partner at a big professional service firm or account manager at a big service-based company like a healthcare company, they're really excited and they've got to bolt on these relationship skills to a decade or two of technical skills. In that case, adding is a great idea. The problem is a lot of times they want to do everything. They want to do every idea that every mentor they've ever had have done on the growth or the relationship side. So mm-hmm. talk about the idea of what what would your be your advice around somebody that's thinking of strategies in the idea that maybe less is more or how to find the right number or I, this is a bit metaphorical when we're talking about strategies or themes, but in general, just give us your top of mind stream of consciousness on this. Yeah. Well, I would empathize a lot with that too, right? Because like, it it seems like when you get to those positions, 
what's gotten you there is doing every single thing that's been asked of you, right? And now by you're in this position where you yeah. can't do everything anymore, right? Yeah. You can't do it well, at least. And so, so it's a real, real challenge. I would say that, you know, we talked, this ties back into that notion of competence, right? Where, okay, it's easier to display competence by adding because there's visible evidence of it. But you can display competence by subtracting, right? And we all yeah. can think of these examples. I mean, Steve Jobs is a really cliche yeah. one, but nobody looks at the iPhone and says, oh, the Apple couldn't think of more buttons to put on that. They say, yeah. oh, it, this was clearly the objective, right? And so I think, you know, taking that to the, if you're now all of a sudden in charge of strategy for an organization, it's like if you have a streamlined strategy, you can it can be obvious that that is intentional. And I think you can even do extra work to kind of show, hey, look, this is intentionally a streamlined strategy. Here are the 10 other things that we thought of, but we're not going to do them so that we can do these three things well. So it's a little bit yep. of making your making your subtractions visible, I guess, guess would be the meta principle. And then you could think about how to, how to do that in your specific context. That makes a lot of sense. You know, it makes me think of a, some research. I, I think the research name is Suzanne Shu. I think she's at UCLA. She wrote oh, a yeah, paper yeah. called, yeah. Oh, good. Uh -huh. So you may, oh. you may know Suzanne. I don't. But anyway, she's written a paper called When Three Charms But Four Alarms. Uh -huh. And we cite that in, in our training. And it's all about value propositions and how many things do you say you're good at tested in a bunch of different domains. And basically she looked at from zero, well, not zero, but one, two, three, four, all the way up to 10 value props effectively. And uh -huh. there was this curve of the peak of like effectiveness was at three and then it just drops like a rock. So somebody's saying, I'm good at 10 different things. Everybody's like, you're not good at anything. I don't believe it. So <laughs> by awesome. subtracting, yeah. So yeah. maybe that's the same with strategies is there's like a magic around three. That's a lot of times we teach in our classes is like, hey, pick the three big themes you're going to focus on and let go of the la la the rest because then that gives you focus. I don't know if that, I mean, it was interesting you said three and we hadn't rehearsed that. So just no, your thoughts I think, on this. Uh, I, it's funny because like I like you do a lot of writing, I do a lot of writing, right? And that's kind of, if you do a list with four things in it, people are like, yeah. no, you got to get rid of one of these, right? It's got, it's supposed yeah. to be three. And there's, I mean, it's even kind of biblical, right? I mean, <laughs> like this yeah. like notion of, and I'm sure in other cultures and religions. So yeah, that's funny. And there's also a uh, kind of a parallel concept that I'm sure you're familiar with in terms of like how many things can we keep in our working memory at the same time, yeah. right? Yeah. And there's a classic paper of like the lucky number seven plus or minus two. And it, you know, yeah. the, the exact number isn't important, but it's like, hey, you can only be truly bringing a certain number of concepts to bear on any situation at any given time. Yeah, I love that. So practical takeaway audience, I'm thinking of where we're going to have the prestigious law firm next week, really excited about it and got to meet all the participants ahead of time. So I was reading all of their bios and like the number of matters that people would have would sometimes be 20, 30, 40 matters that those lawyers had worked on. I wonder if there's a way to, to carve it up and say, hey, here's the, like have a top three and mm -hmm. then have everything else or somehow finding ways, everybody find ways to to focus the mind of the decision makers or whatever you're doing onto the most important things. And if you want to give other things later, that's more like an appendix or a separate section or something like that. All right. Yeah. And there's Nick, real, I mean, yeah, can I ahead. chime in on that? I have, yes. like, there's, I've seen it done brilliantly because this is a classic thing that academics do, right? It's like, here's my 30 page CV and oh, I'm not yeah. going to look at any of that. It's like literally everything I've ever done met with a student, you know, <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> had a but, meeting uh, on Tuesday yeah. on Zoom. <laughs> on Zoom, yeah, Zoom in parentheses. But I've seen the guy do it who does a lot of speaking and he said, I've consulted for companies such as, I, I'll just make up some company names because I know them, but like Acuity, yep. Agility, Accenture, and others not beginning with A, right? So he gives the same effect there, right? It's like, here are three examples that are credible. I love that. And I, by the way, I do a ton more but yeah, that's what you want to know as the as the listener. You know there's something else there, right? That's yeah. been subtracted, but you also know that this person cares enough about you that they're not going to make you read through 400 different consulting companies or yeah. companies that they've helped. Yeah. yeah, and back to the shoe research, what she found was that by adding more, it, it diluted the power of your best three. And to your right. example, like 
how cool it is that speaker, I don't know if they really used alliteration like you did, but that's even more brilliant because it, no, it's they like, did. it, it, did, it yeah. implies, I got so many, I got three good ones that start with A, and that's yeah, the first that, letter no, that's to exactly what he did, yeah. Yes, yeah. it makes yeah. it funny. That's really good. Um, yeah. All right, I've got so many places to apply. Get buckle up, lady, because we got a bunch of them. Here's the next one. How do you apply subtract to deepening relationships? Well, I mean, the simple way is just, you know, that that's kind of an opportunity cost thing with our relationships, right? It's like you want to have these massive networks on LinkedIn with, you know, 2 million people, but at some point you're sacrificing the relationships that you want to have, whether even professional relationships, right? It's like, I've got a friend, Ben, who I would like talking to him is like one of the most useful things I can do professionally and personally. And I don't want to like sacrifice that time for some other kind of diverse, you know, divert, trying to just artificially diversify my relationship. So I think yeah. that's, you know, kind of thinking about that opportunity cost is a theme that comes up a lot with subtracting. Because when you, when you add something, you're effectively saying no to every single other possible thing. Right. And so like keeping that, keeping that space clear has some value. Yeah, that's super interesting. When you say that again, when you add something you're saying no to, every single other possible thing you could be doing. Yeah. Whether it's a relationship or whether it's a, you know, it's something you've committed time to or whether it's something you're thinking about. Yeah. Our audience, a lot of people that have gone through our class would know this. Some who haven't wouldn't, but we have an idea called a protomoy list, which is it's a Greek word. Love it because it doesn't have an English direct translation, but it means first among equals. Some okay. folks who speak fluent Greek will tell me it means first in order, but it basically a protomoy list as we define as, hey, who are your top eight or 10 relationships you really want to focus on? Writing them down is the first step to almost manifesting like a deeper yeah. relationship with those folks. And it keeps keeps your focus on them in the proactive way versus versus reactive. You know, it makes me think also that everybody I know that's got like a really, really big LinkedIn following, for example, or Twitter or whatever, very few of them are actually doing all the posts themselves. Um, <laughs> yeah. They've so got all the people. Same. They've yeah. got people writing those posts and saying, Great, thanks, and yeah. things like that. So I think I don't I think that's a little secret in the author speaker circles that that the audience wouldn't know. But audience, if you're trying to duplicate what a famous author speaker is doing and trying to get their ninety thousand you know, followers on LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever, I guarantee you they've got a small team of people making that happen and it's going to be really hard for you to do it. So Lydie, you're just your quick hot take on that. No, I think, and I just envision those people tweet, like talking to each other, right? Like they're, cause I'm sure the yeah. author hires like 10% <laughs> of their time. Right. And then another author hires 10% of their time. And so it's like a, like a recent college grad and probably like a Harvard grad in a room, like yeah. tweeting at themselves from different author accounts. But <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> that's I, super I think funny, that, but like yeah. I often get asked this goes back to what you said about, you know, to writing down the, the relationships that matter to you. Because people will yeah. say, well, what do I subtract and what do I add specifically? I don't know. I don't know. It depends on what your vision is. And I think that that's a great example of actually taking the time to give yourself some clarity about what your vision is with your relationships, right? It's like, okay, yes. these are the ones that matter to me. Now, all of a sudden, should I subtract the meeting with this person who's on my top 10? No. Should I subtract the meeting with the yes. person who's never going to be on it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. One of our one-liners is a, a great contract might make your year, but a great relationship can make your entire career super yeah. true in this expert-driven world that we work in. And and the only way you can make that happen is by really focusing. And one of the ways to focus is to write things down. So it just, it all follows through. Okay, next one. I am <laughs> super interested in this one. It might be one of the most important we cover. And it's about subtracting things to get more time. Yeah. Obviously, you've been asked this a million times. <laughs> but everybody I can think of is like, oh my gosh, I'm overwhelmed. I can't keep up. There's too much to do. I'm too busy. Air quotes around that audio listeners what's your take on that lady what's your advice it's funny too because it's like classic a little bit of that is humble bragging right it's like oh i'm so busy ah. and you know you're supposed to be like impressed by that you can't manage your your life but i'm too busy too so i i understand but i think yeah. it's hard again to subtract time and you know 
the, one of the ways to do it is to spend money to save time, right? And there's been some classic experiments. Ashley Willens was done, did, did a really elegant one where they, you know, first they saw the people that spent money to save time were happier. Damn. And then they, you're like, well, of course, right? Tell, like, tell me more about that. I think that's yeah. worth digging, well, digging in on. I mean, we just, every other Monday we have this small team. It's two people of people who come and clean the house. And I know this is a ridiculously simple example. I this. love them every time they come in. I look at them and I say, thank you for what you're doing. And yeah. Becky and I just met in the kitchen, you know, for lunch. We had a quick lunch, my wife, and we just felt so good. Because <laughs> the house was clean. We have yeah. a bird, two cats, a dog. There's hair everywhere. It's obviously not coming from me. So just having <laughs> somebody sweep through and tidy everything up is glorious. And I can guarantee you I'm happier because they do that. And, and we can do that in our business worlds. We can hire teams. We can do all kinds of things. So at bigger, obviously bigger, more meaningful examples. But Lighty, your take on that, I, I'm actually super interested in what that study shared. Yeah. I mean, so like one of the so the first response to that might be, well, of course those people are happy or they can afford a person to come in and clean their house, right? And yeah. that's like a small population, small subset of society that can do that. But they actually controlled for income and it didn't have anything to do with income. And then they actually ran an experiment, which is like the best proof. And, and they gave people money and assigned some of them to spend it on saving time and others could just, you know, go buy crap on Amazon and the people who spend money to save time were were happier afterwards. So again, it correlates with happiness or it, it brings happiness and it is kind of independent of how much material wealth you have. And I think that but it's also hard, right? Because we've been talking a lot about like, okay, showing competence. And all of those things were like, okay, I want to just stop doing something. When you spend some money to save time, you're paying to stop doing something, right? It's like, yeah. you're now no longer am I going to show competence by cleaning the house and I'm going to pay somebody else to do it. So yeah. it's a challenge, but it, you know, it's, it's worth it. And you know, that, that example also ties into your point earlier about the people who get up to these positions in an organization, right? That's you're doing that effectively the same thing, right? No longer can you do it. You've got to figure out whether it needs to be done and who else could potentially do it and then find and allocate resources to it. Yeah. Well, I'll give you a, a personal example at the end of, so we were taping this audience in May of 2023 through the magic of podcasting, it'll come out later. But Around this time last year, I almost killed myself at the end of the first quarter, like a month before now, because our business had grown so much the year before as if people exited the pandemic and we had not built up our resources. So Lighty, it took you know, it takes a year for us to to find great trainers and coaches, to go through this rigorous certification process, to give them enough co-facilitation opportunities, they're ready to fly on their own. It's about a year journey, and we added about 10 new facilitators and coaches. And so it took a long time to to ramp up, to pull me out. I was still doing way too much of the delivery work in our business. And that's not something you can flip a switch on. And okay. I think sometimes because there's a delay between adding, hiring people to help you do things. I mean, let's throw out the hire people to clean your house idea, because that's a, that's a simple thing. But you know, if I'm a senior partner at a professional service firm, if I'm an account executive, big healthcare company, it can actually be detrimental to me for a few months to bring on new resources. I've got to find them. I've got to interview them. I've got to onboard them. I've got to train them. And the payoff isn't for a long longer. Do you think mm -hmm. that's part of the reason sometimes it's hard to bring on re resources so that we can subtract to do's from our list and give them to somebody else? Yeah, definitely. I mean, just the, the amount of certainty. 100 percent certain that you're going to be spending this money and you're it's less than 100 percent certainty that it's going to be returned to you i mean you're taking That's, a calculated risk but it's yes. still more of a risk than just kind of pocketing the money and overloading yourself <laughs> so yeah so i think the so audience if we can be like super practical if you are finding yourself overwhelmed one thing is obviously to, to delegate more to your team now. Another thing is to really take a long-term 
approach and say, hey, it may take me six months till this is going to fix itself, but I've got to start today finding more resources, finding fractional folks in the organization that can help me, hiring new people, reallocating workloads, training people up, whatever lever we're going to pull with with existing or, or future resources, we've got to start doing that now because it takes a long time for that payoff to happen. Um, well, and, and I mean, even your example has a good illustration there, right? Where it's like you didn't, it's not like you decided to do that without any indication that there was a market for doing it, right? You decided to do it once you saw, oh, geez, good point. it's here. I've got to, now I can I'm in trouble. the thing yeah. and it's going to service it. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's right on. I mean, I want to say I would like, I, I keep track of various metrics. Like I know you watch part of the Kelly O'Hara interview. Yeah, yeah. We'll put that in the show notes, everybody. If you haven't watched it, you got to watch it. But we talk about in that episode, of course, she's on the, or was on the U.S. Women's National Team, best footballer in America when she was at Stanford, all kinds of, won two World Cups, a gold medal in the Olympics, all that stuff. But she tracks every single thing she does and reviews her own data. And I, I had already been doing some of that, but I really took it a step up after talking with Kelly. And one of the things I noticed when I did a little quarterly review a year ago was how much I was working on things that other people could do had if we had them, how much I wasn't doing things I really enjoyed doing, like interviewing really cool thought leaders like you, Lighty. And uh, <laughs> it was really, I, I was almost, I almost bathed in the regret at that, I took a week off about that time and looked at all the numbers and did a strategy going forward. And I felt a lot of regret for not starting earlier. And it was through that almost negative that a positive came out of it. Cause I was like, no more. I am mm-hmm. I am gonna start always looking like a year ahead from now forward because I cannot be in this place anymore. Yes. So quick sidebar, can we, can, after we talk, can we get the citation for that study about how people are happier when they spend money to save more time? Cause I'd love to put that in the show notes for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. After we talk that, that yeah. yeah, it's Liz Dunn and Ashley Wellens are the two lead authors. It's a proceeding of national Academy of sciences article, but I'll, I love it. I love it. Cool. So we'll get that later. So then let's, let's shorten the time frame a little bit. We're still into this sort of mantra of time what's your advice for people even before they like beef up their resources takes a long time what are things people can do like today this week if they're feeling overwhelmed too busy air quotes how can they subtract you know when they look at the week view or month view on their calendar how can they subtract stuff out i would say i mean the general principle is to as you're listening to this podcast or right after just take some time to figure out how you can build this into your processes, right? And it um, doesn't have to be your grand processes. It can just be, okay, each week I do a to-do list. Now I'm going to force myself to put stop doings on that list, right? So you're you're, que- you're effectively queuing subtraction. And it's funny, Bo, because you just gave yeah. this great example of the most influential week in your last year, and you didn't, you framed it as taking a week off, right? <laughs> and so yeah. it's like, if you yeah. can build that in every year to your calendar, this is like, yeah. okay, I'm going to subtract the day-to-day work and in fact, actually do the strategic thinking work. So anything from a stop doing to uh, annual reviews, right? Okay. Now I'm going to ask people in addition to the new initiatives they're going to work on in the next year, what are the things you're currently doing that you're yes. going to stop doing? We talked a lot about this desire to display competence. Imagine yourself a new employee trying to display to the boss that you're doing an amazing job, it's really hard to say, hey, I'm going to stop doing this thing, right? But if it gets flipped around, the framing where it's like now they're looking to us for ideas of ways to take things away, to make the organization better, to make my day-to-day better, you can display competence by subtracting. So the general principle there is like, think about the critical decision points in your processes and build in reminders to think about subtracting. I'll give one more. Uh, Just whenever you add a rule, say, okay, you also have to think of two rules that currently exist that you should think about taking away, right? That kind of balances the books on rules and organizational red tape and things like that. Yeah, Lighty, this is so powerful. I think, audience, what I want you to pay attention to is to have a cue for doing this. Cue, yeah. I think that's brilliant. So whether that's in your to-do list, time in your calendar, whatever, it has to happen. And it was it's interesting, Lighty, because as I, you're causing me to reflect back on some of my favorite interviews on the show, 
One was with Molly Fletcher, who's an author, speaker, and expert on all kinds of things. Vanessa Van Edwards, who's a similar but an, an expert in human relationships and becoming capt- captivating. Her book's called that. Things like that. They both have a cue that I that I grabbed. Molly looks, I think, quarterly and looks backwards and says, "What stuff did I do last quarter that I'm not going to do going forward?" Vanessa meets with her team, if I remember this right, monthly. And I'll put these in the show notes, audience. So you can go back and listen to these. They're both all star episodes. Vanessa meets with her team monthly for like an hour and says, what stuff did all of us do where each of us should take away to to go with another? And oh, Lighty, awesome. the med- yeah, the med- yeah. so the metaphor I use in my mind is a ladder. Like if we're climbing a ladder of impact, if we want to have a bigger impact in our lives, do more of the stuff we really like, that's always changing. But you know, the next thing we're excited about can change over time and with the role we should play should change. So as I think about it as ladder, if metaphorically, if I'm going to climb up a rung, I've got to take my foot off a rung on the bottom because in, the, in my little metaphor, time is ladder. A ladder is time. So yeah. every what so what I adopted from Molly and Vanessa is once a quarter, and that's what happened a year ago. But I do it every quarter. I take about an hour. I go back look at the last quarter, and I go find fifty hours. What's fifty hours of stuff I did that? Yeah, maybe it made sense at some point in the past. But it doesn't make sense going forward. It makes up about 10% of our work time if we work 50 hours a week-ish, you know, maybe a little more, a little less. But even if I don't come up with exactly 50, I come up with 42, that's really valuable going forward because I'm going to shed that. I'm going to subtract it. The queue is there. It's in my calendar. That's the only purpose for that one-hour meeting with myself once a quarter. And man, it has been a big unlock for me. So anyways, that that's the example of what a queue could look like. Oh, that's so beautiful. I talk in the book about Jenga, playing Jenga instead of Legos, because Jenga forces you to pull out a block and then put it on top. And that's how you're growing. But, you know, the this is why I love having these conversations. (laughs) You know, that's such a beautiful example of playing Jenga, right? The 42 hours is the block that you're pulling out so that you can put it on top, right? It's beautiful. Yeah, that's right. Jenga is almost a more fun. That's a lot more fun than a ladder. Yes. (laughs) Um, No, I don't think so. I think, (laughs) no, the, the problem with the ladder very clearly articulates that you're you're moving forward whereas yeah. jenga it's like kind of eventually it all falls down so i think the ladder oh that's change true the ladder um, <laughs> i'm gonna but, stay with yeah. the ladder yeah yeah, yeah the ladder implies we're just gonna go up forever in our little time metaphor but the yeah. jenga eventually crumbles to the ground and it's broken <laughs> yeah it's a- um, all right next one this is fun because i feel like it's fun because i'm throwing all the all these curveballs so one of the things we can manage is obviously our time the other thing we can manage is our energy so when you think about applying subtract to energy, give us give us your hot take on how we can be more successful. Well, I know you're a runner, right? So I'll start with the running one, but like just tapering, right? Before a race, that's classic example. Ah, and it's yeah. funny how long it took people to come up with that. I, I didn't I didn't do a fact check of this history, but it seems to me like that started to become a thing when there was this guy, Zapotec, who got sick before a really big race, couldn't do his regular training, and then did the race anyway after he had recovered and did really well. And then people were like, oh, maybe if we didn't run so much right before, we would kind of store up our energy. So that's a, a running one that matters more and more the older you get with running, right? But I, I think of it in terms of cognitive energy too, right? Like last yeah. week I was going to speak in Washington, D.C. and It was at three o'clock and I had the whole train ride there and all the way up till three o'clock where I didn't have anything to do. And I'm like writing for my next book and all these things that I could be doing. But I'm like, no, I just can't like spend the cognitive energy this morning because I need to save that cognitive energy to be on my toes for the speaking. And it's a thing that I've done a ton of times. But then there's the Q&A part at the end where it's like, you got to be on your toes. You got to have your yeah, hundred percent like cognition with you. So that's another one where you just kind of think about, okay, where do I need my maximum cognitive energy today? How am I going to use it? I think this also, is like, really good. You yeah, know, there's that classic advice of what when's your most productive time, and then you do the most important work during that time. And it's it's a version of that because it's not. I mean, sure, we can kind of build up our endurance the same way we do with running, but it's not infinite. Well, that is really good. So the the takeaway there is maybe at a weekly level, especially on a daily level, taking a look at where where are my points of leverage where if I do that thing really well today, that's going to make the day a win. 
and you're actually conserving some energy right before it or is that the advice that's I, exactly that's brilliant. yeah that's yeah. beautiful yeah and i think yeah you know you can you can always tweet and connect pe- with people on linkedin you don't need your mental energy so that but you need it for the uh for the big things yeah this is brilliant okay all right next up i i just have i'm on a soapbox on this one that people spend way too much time writing emails. I got an email the other day from a close friend. He was introducing me to somebody else, long story. But he wrote this email that, I mean, it was like half a chapter in a book, Lydie. I'm like, yeah. that would take me like 10 hours to write. And it, I mean, maybe maybe it took an hour, 90 minutes. But like it, an introduction, it just doesn't have to be this long. How about a quick phone call with each person that says, hey, does it make sense? I like double opt-in intros. This person does too. So like, a quick email or or even like an iOS voice message of Vox, which is an asynchronous communication tool. You leave little messages. There's just so many ways that are more effective than email. But yet I see people spending almost, I don't know why, maybe because it's comfortable, but a lot of time writing novels in email. I'm like, no. How, so how can we subtract more out of email? Cal Newport has a good book on the end of email. You should get him on. But I think I the other real drawback with email, right, is it's so easy to produce the information, right? I, I don't care as much about a really well done introduction. It's like, yeah, you feel sorry for the person who did it because I would have responded. My response doesn't change whether it's a clear, short introduction or just a really verbose one. But there's the one where, you know, they send it to 20 people because it's so easy to add the listserv and you're not like, wow. considering the 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 cost of for the first time in history i've let me see if i can get this right it's like what's new is not our you know the fact that there's a lot of information what's new is the fact that we the cost of producing the information is far outweighed by the cost of consuming the information right it used well, to be you write a book and it had to be like printed on you know some some physical place and it's really hard. It's actually hard to produce the book and you have to distribute it around. It costs a whole bunch of money and then a person reads it. Now it's super easy to get information out there in the world. And the, by far the dominant cost is the time of the person who's consuming it. Right. And, wow. um, you know, it's one thing for books and things that have had a lot of thought put into them where it's worth the time to consume them. And then it's another thing entirely for just a spam email where you're like, oh, I think I better make sure that everybody in the department gets this email instead of just the one person who's actually going to to act on it. So yeah, don't get me started on email. What are those tools that you mentioned? There's asynchronous. I would love that. You can send a voice message without actually having to talk to somebody. Is yeah, that in the my way? own. These, yes. But, I mean, because are... I don't like to interrupt people. That's why I don't call. Right, That's because right. the email yes. allows them to check on their own time. But, exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. So what I've I've found that vo- like voice, like just saying something, is about mm-hmm. ten times faster than typing something. Sure. So you can imagine how quickly if you were sending me a message like, "Hey Mo, really enjoyed the the podcast today," and you gave five or six specifics, man, you could if you had a a tool that air quotes that would let you send that just by recording your voice. You can imagine how much faster that is in typing, making sure you spell things right, rewriting it, changing your words around, all that stuff. In my, right. in my, about a ten x is the is the throughput difference. And then with a tool like, so we can use anybody that's on Apple devices. You can use iOS Voice Message to do that. There's a little. Okay. It's within the Messages function. You can see how to do it on your phone or your iPad or whatever. But that's a real easy way to do it for most people. If you want to go deeper on your teams. There's a tool called Voxer and you download it, it's free. And then there's a little paid subscription that makes it a little better. But what's beautiful about Voxer is you have a history of all your asynchronous messages back and forth, and you can listen at two, three, and four X speed. Okay. So if it's 10 X faster to leave the message and three X faster to listen to it, because all the right. ums, all the all the 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 not talking parts go away. You got a 30x improvement all the way through. And so we use it on our team. I use it with some of my friends that that were sort of in an inner, like we we help, we run each other, help each other run our businesses and things like that. And then we're just leaving each other async messages all the time. And mm-hmm. you listen to it when you have a chance. You're not bugged to your point. And it just works so, so much faster than everybody sending emails or Slack messages or whatever. Slack. 
That's that's really neat. Thank you for sharing that. I do yeah. think that there's a place too just for like, okay, how much of this communication is actually necessary, right? Because we can we'll run into the same yes. trap, right? Now it's ten times faster to send it and we're just gotta be sending more stuff and not thinking about, okay, is this something that the person needs yes. to hear? Because I mean, I think that the that's the tool and then Eventually, it's going into somebody's brain and thinking about that instead of something else. And there's an opportunity cost there too. Yes, 100%. And to your point, you know, when I leave a Voxer, don't do it all the time, but I need to do it all the time. Where I, I need to think through and just like in my mind think, hey, what are my three points I'm going to leave? And then no, that yeah. avoids the whole stream of consciousness, you know, blabbering on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what can I subtract or be crisp about? Well, audience, what we'll do is I'll put the links to Voxer. And an equivalent that also has video is called Marco Polo. I've got a lot of friends that use Marco Polo. So that takes the audio Voxer and it adds a video component. And so much of communication is visual that it's actually super interesting to have Marco Polo too. You can also listen it at enhanced speeds and things like that. All right. So Lighty, a couple fast questions here at the end. I know we're sprinting to the finish. I am super interested in our last sort of application question. You do a lot of speaking to large groups, a lot of big keynote speeches, things like that. I'm just curious from your perspective, when you're in that Q&A you mentioned before, what bubbles to the top of like, what's the most interesting question or where the most value is that you see people struggling with these days? What, what, what would you say is your sort of number one question that you could add value to that I, I haven't, we haven't covered yet? Boy, I think the most important question that comes up is like, how do we do this in our ideas, right? How do we do this in our mental models? Because Interesting. That's, to me, it's like, that's everything, right? That's, I'm a lifelong learner. I care about creating and sharing knowledge. And yet the dominant way that we learn is to, you know, it's called knowledge construction. <laughs> we add, right? We take what's in our brains and we try to add new stuff on top of it. And I'll tell you a short story that, so Ezra, my son, he's eight now, so he's on the tail end of his belief in Santa Claus. But when he was a little younger, he got Legos from Santa Claus. And he goes to me like, what's this? Why I, why did Santa Claus give me Legos? Said, what do you mean? You asked Santa Claus for Legos. And he's like, yeah, but Santa Claus doesn't have like, the, he just makes wood toys and things like that. And I said, oh, oh, I get it. Yeah, yeah, no, Santa for Legos and things like that, he just works directly with Amazon. And Ezra was like, oh, great. But, you know, that that works because it's squared with what was in his already head, right? And so we all have this tendency to, like, when we're presented with new information that clearly conflicts with what we already believe, instead of subtracting our old wrong beliefs, we modify what's in our head and yeah. sometimes sometimes skew it. And so I think, like, just really thinking about what is our process for getting rid of wrong ideas. And, you know, I, I don't have a brilliant ways to do it. I mean, I think part of it for me is just like setting the time aside where it's like, okay, I'm consciously going to think about this now. What are the things that I've been kind of taking for granted versus things that I should be kind of questioning and subtracting? I was talking to some judges before, and I mean, they were talking about some of the ways that they did this. And it's like, that's how important that is right for just how our society is functioning that they're thinking about doing that so i would i mean maybe it goes back to my general advice about like how do you put in place cues to remind yourself yeah to subtract those ideas that aren't serving you well anymore i don't know if you've got ideas for that mo you probably well do. you'll get you could see me moving around spot. here yeah I'll, yeah no you'll love it we have all these modules that teach people how to do business development and grow their book of business their relationships their career this is module 17 Okay. And in module 17, it's all about developing your next year strategy. And one of the most critical parts, you'll get a kick out of this audio listeners. I know you can't see it, but one of the steps is to create a to don't list. Mm -hmm. And you use the word to don't a little bit ago. And I just yeah, yeah. grinned from year to year. I don't know if you noticed, but we even have people list out whether you're your to don'ts. And then in the column, we have them just estimate last year, how many hours could you save by either eliminating, which is the the, the golden that's the big one, or delegating or automating. And typically when we do this with groups, and I'm not exaggerating, the typical numbers we get per year of hours saved is 500 to like 800 hours. Like 
It's like a it's third amazing. of your year or more. I oh know, and it happens yeah. over and over again. And when it happened, like the first time we ever put it in over a decade ago, I'm like, wow, this group really could use some help. But then when it happens over and over and over, like think of the, think of the, the value we can create by subtracting a third of our low value stuff we do every single year. Like this is significant. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. I know we're, I know we don't have too much time. So let's do this. We're going to go, we're going to do through four questions super fast. Are you ready? Yep. I'm ready. I'll, okay. I'll answer fast. What, I promise. No, no, no. It's going to be great. So this will be fun. It'll be like the speed round. So what do you do to keep learning? I read a lot. I'm fortunate to have a job where I'm like, I'm supposed to be creating and sharing knowledge. So I also try to subtract a lot of these things that are continuing to learn. So read a lot yep. and talk to interesting people like you. I always try to kind of take advantage of opportunities like this one. That's a really good way to learn about the real world. Yeah. When my friend Tim Grohl and I were talking about, should I start a podcast or not? He's like, would you enjoy doing it? I'm like, I would wake up every morning loving it. I get to talk to interesting people. He's like, then do it. <laughs> it was yeah. so simple. All right. Yeah. What are lies when it comes to subtraction addition kind of stuff? What are lies that you hear people tell themselves that get in their own way? The subtracting is going to be easy. I think that mm -hmm. it's, in fact, it's a little bit more thought. It's a little bit more kind of mental effort. It's a little bit more process effort, right? To, to subtract something, you have to have added it in the first place. And it's not super hard and it can still be fun. But if you think it's going to be easy, that's it's not the same thing as that. That's just doing nothing. Um, fascinating. Oh, that's rich. That's good. Um, <laughs> I think what I've learned in this episode is you got to have cues. I mean, that's one theme I've heard throughout that's mm -hmm. really powerful. Yep. Okay, how do you how do you keep going even when you have setbacks? There's this quote that I like. I don't know who it's attributed to, but it just life is ten percent what happens to you and ninety percent how you react to it. And maybe those numbers are, aren't exact, but that's that's how I think about setbacks. That's just something that happened to me. What's my reaction gonna be? I love it. Get back up. Keep going. Whatever. Okay. okay last one. Fan favorite. It's time, the, Lighty, for the wheel. The super, the super nice. no, I know you're excited about the wheel. I am. Um, it's awesome. The super powerful inspirational nudge. We used to pick what pizza we were going to get when the girls were still at home with this. Lots of other uh, that's things. That's the only luck we've had with our kids eating healthy food was to put it on one of those like lazy Susan wheels. So that's it all. It's all broccoli it's all, all, all the way around, back. and then you spin it. <laughs> <laughs> no, they spin it and then eat feta cheese off of it. You know, it's like, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. This is interesting. So what cadences do you have to plan, execute, and stay on track? Oh, boy. So I think I do a lot of executing and staying on track. And it's like, okay, trusting that I'm going to, to do the work and continue to kind of push forward on something. And then the, the cadence is how how often am I kind of pulling myself back out of that kind of analogous to your week last year <laughs> where you said, okay, yeah. what, what's actually going on here? Am I aligned? And so, I mean, I think a, a small cadence is kind of on a weekly basis, just really yep. looking at, okay, what are my most important things that I'm working on this week? How am I going to align my time with them? And then on a kind of less regular basis, just saying, okay, like what are, what are my new opportunities? What are my big goals? Have they changed at all? And am I still kind of putting all this work in the right direction? Do you do that? I don't know we're out about out of time, but do you, I assume you have sort of a school year rhythm to all that too. Is yeah, it sort of it annual was, that you're doing that? Yeah, it's super fortunate to be a professor because, yep. you know, the semester just ended and it's a perfect time to kind of take stock. And then, you know, next semester I have a sabbatical, which I mean, that's the original intent of those, I think, right, is to... Yeah. <laughs> To be able to take a step back and say, am I doing the highest value thing that I could be doing? Yep. E Excellent. This is awesome. All right. So the audience is going to want to read, a lot of the audience is going to want to reach out to you. What's the best way? Obviously buying subtract everybody product placement here. No shame. It's up <laughs> right near the camera for you audience, audio listeners. The book is called, uh, the book is about subtract. It's called Subtract, <laughs> The <laughs> Untapped Science of Less. Lydie Klotz is L-E-I-D-Y-K-L-O-T-Z. What Obviously, buying the book's a no-brainer, but but what else would you say? I mean, I love coming and talking to organizations or groups that are trying to do this. I learn as much as they learn, I think, and I think that I've done enough of it that I'm 
add a little bit of value. And yeah, the book has all the the best ideas. And I'm like you said, my parents gave me a good Google name, right? So you can Google me and find my email address if you've got uh, specific things you want to talk about. Yeah, that is good. You know, Mo Bundle's been good for me in that way too. Exactly. You got to think about that. There's only days. one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably wasn't too hard to get the domain name, I would guess. No, when, it was easy. Like, yeah. It, easy. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Lighty, this has been so fun. I learned a ton and I was just super excited about this. Read the book twice because it was really valuable. So audience, go out and grab it. Lighty, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Mo. Keep up the good work.